And today we are going to continue the chain rule, although it might not look like we're continuing anything, it might look like a completely new topic. You remember I said the chain rule is traditionally presented in two different ways. And the day before yesterday was what the textbook calls version one, and today is what we call version two. To sort of see the relationship between these things, let's recall what we did yesterday. Yesterday we had I keep saying yesterday, though of course it wasn't, but the day before yesterday, we looked at situations where we have not two, but three variables. So maybe we have a circular, this is an example we did, maybe we have a circular plate and we're heating it. And the radius of the plate depends on the amount of time we've spent heating it. Let me use function notation. And then the area of the plate depends on the radius. And we made the observation that if we have these situations, the area of the plate depends on the time as well. And you see that via composition. We stick this radius in to the area. We get that the area is pi times this linear expression squared. And since the area is a function of time, asking, asking what the derivative of the area with respect to time is makes sense. Uh, not sure why I chose a uh, capital T, but this is the amount of time that the plate has been heated. And we can find the derivative of the area with respect to the time using the chain rule version one. The chain rule version one says to find this derivative you find those two individual derivatives and you multiply them together. And then there's some other stuff. You are going to um, end up with two variables. You'll have to do a replacement step, but So we can find the derivative of the area with respect to the time using the chain rule. But suppose by the time that we've come on to the scene, somebody has done this composition. So somebody has just made the observation that the area of the plate is a function of the time. Let me again use function notation. And when you arrive on the scene, you're just hit with that form of without those preliminary steps. 
Well, it still makes sense to ask for the derivative of the area with respect to time, but because we don't have those preliminary functions written down, we can't ask for dr dt, and we can't ask for da dr. So the question that arises, can we take the derivative of a of t directly without any reference to these formulas? And the answer is that we can, using the chain rule version two. And I'm going to present the chain rule version two. I'm going to do a few examples without any real world meaning, just as abstract math. And then we'll come back to this and we will solve the problem. We'll find the ADT without any reference to those individual derivatives. So the chain rule version two is for when we have composition. We have an out side function f and we have an inside function g and we want to take the derivative of this composition the chain rule version two says that we can do this in several steps. We'll start by taking the derivative of the outside function. You remember uh, I had a whole homework assignment that was basically identifying outside and inside functions. Now you see the motivation for that. Anyway, the chain rule says take the derivative of the outside function, then take the inside function, and stick it back inside. But we're not done. The chain rule then says take the derivative of the inside function and multiply all of that together. And as with so much in mathematics, I think this is going to be quite cryptic until we see an actual example. This is maybe a little complicated. Let's scroll past it for now. And let me say that we've got the sign <coughs> of not going to spend the rest of the semester doing this color coding, but for now I'll let blue be outside, red be inside. We've got this function f of x, and we want to know once the derivative of f of x. So our outside function here is the sine, and our inside function is x squared plus x. 
let's just go back and take a look. The chain rule says that to start with, so let's call this step one, to start with, you should take the derivative of the outside function. The outside function is the sine, the derivative of the sine is the cosine. The chain rule then says we should take the inside function and we should stick it back into that derivative. So the inside function is x squared plus x. We stick it back in to that derivative. Finally, the chain rule says that we should take the derivative of the inside function and multiply it by that composition that we just created. So, the derivative of the inside function is 2x plus 1, and there is the derivative of that composition. There is the derivative of the sine of x squared <coughs> plus x. So the chain rule really rests on being able to recognize when you have a composition and being able to specifically identify the outside and the inside function. I had a quiz on that to try to sort of drive home its importance. Now we're seeing that importance. And if this is something you're struggling with, you're going to need to get help this is something you can talk to me about. You could go to the library and get help at the tutoring center. We have a very good calculus tutor there. She was in last year's course. But one way or another, you need to get down this chain rule and you need to be able to recognize at a glance when you have these outside and inside functions and what they are. Let's look at another example. Let's stick with trig functions for now. Let's say that f of x is two times, let's spice things up with one of the less common trig functions. <clears throat> well, less common in the pre-calculus, fairly common in the calculus. 2 times the secant of the secant of the sine. 2 times the secant of the sine of x. We can take the derivative of this. That will be our goal. So we have, once again, to be able to recognize that this is 
a composition, and we've got an outside function and an inside function. And once you recognize that, it's kind of plug and play. Let me move down a little so we don't have our lines running together. We want the derivative of the outside function, first of all. That was step one, take the derivative of the outside function. And the derivative of the secant, first of all, let's make a comment about that two. That two is a constant. It just sits there when you take the derivative, doing no harm. Now, the derivative of the secant is the secant times the tangent. And I'm leaving myself some room there because step two is going to be to take the inside function and stick it inside of that derivative. The inside function is the sine. So the sine gets stuck inside this derivative. And then there's a final step. We're not done here. Step three is to take the derivative of this inside function and multiply it. So the derivative of the sine is the cosine. And we take that derivative and we multiply it. And there we go. The derivative of f of x is 2 times the secant of the sine times the tangent of the sine times the cosine. And it's really important to get this pattern down and not to deviate from it. Like something I see a lot in tests and stuff is that a student will take the derivative of the outside function okay, but then often the students also want to take the derivative of the inside function, so I'll get secants of cosines, and that is incorrect. The only time the derivative of the inside function shows up is at the very end. Questions so far about the chain? I thought the chain rule had to do with three uh, variables or three functions. Where's the third function here? Um, the chain rule has to do with three variables. Oh, variables or yeah. the chain rule version one has to do oh, with okay. three variables. It might be the chain rule version one and the chain rule version two are formally equivalent but it might be easier to think of them as just two completely different rules. If you have your three variables and two equations, you use version one. If you have just one composition written down, you use version two. Let's do an example that is not trig, let's look at f of x equals x 
squared plus 2x minus 1 raised to the fifth power. So let's try to take the derivative of this. And you have, once again, as your first step before you write anything down, to recognize that this is a composition. And I mean, as long as I'm color coding the things, it sort of jumps out at you. But again, you need to be able to recognize this in the wild as well. We have a function being raised to a fifth power. So this fifth power <clears throat> is the outside function. And this thing, literally inside the parentheses, I emphasize this when I talked about composition, let me emphasize it again. The inside-outside terminology is usually very literal. The inside function is literally inside the parentheses and we have an inside function and an outside function. One function is stuck inside another. This quadratic is stuck inside a power function. And Let's take the derivative of this whole function. Just one step at a time. Step one is to take the derivative of the outside function. Well, when you take the derivative of a power function, the power comes down, and then the power is reduced by 1. And you'll notice, once again, I'm leaving myself some room to write here, because step two of the chain rule, the inside function is going to then get stuck inside that derivative. So inside of this derivative, goes that inside function. Finally, the chain rule says to take the derivative of the inside function and multiply it. The derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of 2x is 2. The derivative of negative 1 is 0, and we get that derivative. I emphasized I, this got a slide dedicated to it when we first introduced the power rule, that the power rule only works when we have x to a power, that if we had some more complicated expression, we'd need more complicated machinery. We have now seen that machinery. Let's go back to this now. Let me copy this up and 
I won't use that color coding. Let's just copy a of t equals pi times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.0. 0, 0, 1, t raised to the second power. And let's, let's erase, try that again, let's erase everything else. There we go. And let's take the derivative. And I'm no longer color coding this, so let's recognize the outside and the inside function. This is very similar to what we have here. Um, in the sense that we have a power function. We have something inside of a power. And more specifically, we have that function inside of a power function. So the derivative of the outside function that two comes down. The pi is just a constant. It's gonna stay put. That two will become a one. When we differentiate a power function, the power decreases. And um, this inside function just goes back inside of it. It gets left alone. 0 0.5 plus 0 0.001t. Finally, we want to multiply by the derivative of that inside function. The derivative of 0.5 is 0. The derivative of 0.001t is 0 0.001. And in this circumstance, I'm not, a, I'm not a big one on simplifying, but this is being multiplied by 2. So that's 0 times 0, 0, 2 times pi times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.001 times t. So why doesn't the 2 pi get distributed? Um, you mean why don't we take this and multiply it across? I mean we could do that if we wanted to. That would be what to zero point zero zero one pi plus and then we'd have to multiply point zero zero two times point zero zero one, which should be if I'm doing this correctly, four zeros. then a 2, and then a t. I mean, 
you can do that if you want to. It's a little extra simplification. Or was that not what you were asking? No, that's what I was asking. I was just wondering why you didn't carry the pie as well to the... Oh, you're right. Thanks, Steve. So there's the derivative using the chain. At the moment, we're pretty limited in the examples we can do with the chain rule. Um, at the moment, what derivatives do we really know? We know the derivatives of power functions, and we know the derivatives of trig functions, and we've done examples with both of those. We can complicate things slightly, f of x equals x times the sine of x squared plus 1. And I mean, I call this a complication. It's just that f of x is something times something, so we're going to have to use the product rule as well as the chain rule here. And the product rule says, well, first we'll take the derivative of x. <coughs> the derivative of x is 1. This inside function we'll leave alone. Um, now we'll leave x alone. Take the derivative. I said inside function. That was just habit at this point in the lecture. This second function we'll leave alone. Now we leave x alone, and we need to take the derivative of the second function. The derivative of the sine is the cosine. I'm now using the chain rule. We've got an outside function and an inside function. The derivative of the outside function is the cosine. We stick the inside function inside of that. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And again, I'm not a not a fiend for simplification, but that x here and that 2x there do simplify in a very natural way to give us 2x squared. And I am getting sloppy we've got not an x squared there but a cosine of x squared so there's the chain rule. It's in a sort of weird position in the sense it's extremely important. In another sense, there is not a huge amount to say about it other than a few examples, which we did. Why don't we have you 
use it, why don't you find, we'll start kind of simple, why don't you find the derivative of 5 times the tangent of x squared plus x minus 1 for me, and now make sense to go through this now. Um, we have to recognize that not a race, we have to recognize that we have an outside function and an inside function, and then the derivative becomes so the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared that inside function gets stuck inside and then we want the derivative of the inside function. And we could, if we were so inclined, simplify or at least rewrite that, this, uh, this 5 and this 2x plus 1 can go together and make um, 10x plus I want to be very clear on a notational thing. Um, I saw this from a few people as I was walking by. They did the problem correctly, but then they said, okay, we've got the secant, we're squaring it. So let's try that eraser again. We've got the secant, we're squaring it, and they wrote the answer like that. And you cannot do that. This is very bad notation. If people see this, they're not going to think you're squaring the secant. They're going to think you're squaring the quadratic. And that's a completely different thing. So this 2 has to come between the secant and the input of the secant. Otherwise, people are going to misread your answer. And I think we have time for one more example. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to learn some more derivatives. We're going to learn the derivative of the logarithm and the derivative of the exponential. And we're going to go right on doing examples of the chain rule. But for now, let's say h of x equals 2 times x squared minus 1 raised to the seventh power. And I would like you to find for me h prime. We're all on the same page. So this seventh power is going to be our outside function, this x squared minus 1 is going to be our inside function. And again, this terminology is very literal. You'll notice that our inside function is inside the parentheses. So when we take the derivative, that 2 gets left alone, constants just sit there, 
the seven comes down, and then we use the power rule, so that seven becomes a six. That x squared minus one goes back into the, um, back into the function. And finally, we multiply by the derivative of that inside function. And I would say, as I say, I don't always worry about simplification, but if you have, if you have a number times a number times a number, I would at least go as far as multiplying those together. So that's 28 times x times x squared minus 1 to the 6th power. Okay, good hustle, productive day. We'll keep right on with this stuff and we'll learn some new derivatives tomorrow. See you then, right under.